Good morning, Springs Church. It's so great to see all of you today. I wanna invite you to join us. We get to lift up the name of Jesus, amen. God, it is an honor we we get to come into the house as a united family to lift up your most holy name. God, you are glorious, amen. We praise you, Lord. We worship you this morning.
your sacrifice this morning, that by your blood, by your body, we are saved. We sing praises to the King of Kings, the one who is enthroned, seated at the right hand of God. Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. Be exalted this morning, Jesus.
going to take a few moments to go to the communion table together. Um, if you're a believer in this house, we practice open communion, which means that even though you might not be a member of this church, you could feel free to partake with us. Uh, if you have not received the elements, the bread and the juice, if you just raise your hand, we have some deacons here that'll come around and make sure that you have them. There's a few people. They're going to come around and make sure you got them. If you give me permission this morning, as pastor of this house, can we take a few moments not just to rush through this ceremonially, but to really take some time and, and observe what we're about to do together? This is more serious than people think. In fact, can, can I read to you just a few verses from the book of 1 Corinthians of how God actually views this table? In fact, let me turn there. Here, 1 Corinthians. My Bible's all over the place. Here it is. Listen to what he says as he's talking about the communion table. In verse 27 of chapter 11, it says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, listen to this, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Now there's many have died, had a premature death. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. I know those words are heavy, but how many of you know that you can't pick or choose what you want to read in the scriptures? It's the full word of God, his counsel, or it's nothing. That's what transforms us. That's what changes us. And God is saying when we come and we have communion, we have to take a moment and we have to examine some things in our lives. It's important that we do this. This last week I was in prayer. And as I was praying, I, I felt this just heaviness and this fear come over me. I, I, I became very fearful. And that's not uncommon for me. My temperament is anxiety and fear. And I normally notice when it comes on me and I pray it off right away. I began to pray and say, where is this coming from? And started kind of doing a little bit of a laundry list of where the fear might be coming from. And I was praying it saying, God, you have to get it off me. I don't, I don't want to be under this right now. Joy and peace and grace. And I'm praying these things. And I really felt my spirit, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, no, 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 no. this isn't from the enemy. And this isn't from your flesh. I'm allowing this. 
I'm allowing you to sense something because there are things coming in the years ahead. And I wanna start getting you ready. I want you to start being prepared. I want you to sense the spirit that this world is gonna come under. I want you to sense the spirit that many in the church are gonna come over if they're ill-prepared. And I got up and I started praying, said, well, how do I prepare? What are you asking me to do? And this phrase kept on coming back in my prayer time. It was through my readings, but the old Puritans used to say it. They used to call it enlargement of heart. They'd say, we need an enlargement of heart, an enlargement of faith, an enlargement of vision, an enlargement of revelation from God. We need an enlargement. And I started praying and saying, God, I need an enlargement. I need to grow in my faith. I need to grow in my spiritual disciplines. I need to grow in my hunger for you. I need an enlargement so I don't come under that spirit in the days ahead. So I'm standing with absolute confidence so that I could call people to you. And I'm saying, how do I grow in that enlargement? And there's a scripture in the book of Hebrews he brought me to, chapter four, verse one. Many of you know it. It says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Actually, that's what Pastor Billy was preaching on this morning. It was verse 12, um, uh, chapter 12. I'm sorry, right? He says this. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, what does it say? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. If we're gonna grow in this enlargement of heart, we have to let go of everything that hinders. We have to release the sin. We have to confess it and deal with it honestly before God and honestly in our own hearts. And as I was praying these things, I said, God, search me. What do you, what do you see? What do you, and the Lord started bringing some things up. He started saying the way you, you treat your wife, I don't treat my wife harshly. Many people know they watch her. We got a good marriage, but, but I could be neglectful. And he just started saying, you got to watch, you got to love, you got to serve her in greater measures. In fact, he brought something up this week. You'll think it's funny. We were planning our vacation. And as we were looking at the hotels or where we were going, there was a, there was a little bit of a caveat that said, if you had children above four years old, you could only have four people to a room and four and above and daily just turned four. So we called up the travel agent and we gave her all the names of our children and their ages, but we didn't, we didn't tell them what we saw on the website and said, what can you do? And they said, oh, I could get you a room. I'll get you one room. You only need one. And I looked at Beth. I said, if we get one, we can do it. We can afford that, right? And they booked the whole thing. And as, as they were all finished, I walked away and I felt the Holy Spirit saying, you weren't honest. You knew that on the website, they said four and above, you were not being honest. And I called up Beth the next day because I hid it for a day saying, I'm out. and I said, honey, we got to call back the hotel and tell them that this is their policy and make sure we're being honest because we saw it. We saw, it. and I knew what it meant. If they said, no, we're not going on vacation. The kids are all excited. They're ready to go. We got, we bought plane tickets. <laughs> we bought plane tickets. I said, that's, we're going. And not only are we not going on vacation, we're going nowhere because we have no more money left. <laughs> but I felt the Holy Spirit. And by the God's grace, he gave me such a wonderful wife. She called and she said, I feel the same thing. And we got on the phone and we said, we, our child is four and above. And your policy says that we can't have more than four in a room. And we have five all together with all of our kids. And I praise God, God intervened. And they said, no, we're going to make an exception. You guys can come. You can all stay in the room. It's okay. We're going to accept our four. And I'm grateful for that. But do you see how important this is? We have to listen to the Holy Spirit. We have to respond to the Holy Spirit. We have to deal with our hearts because God is saying there's a day coming now. Now, some of you are saying we're already there. We're not. And I don't want to put fear on people. I, I get so scared to share this sometimes. I don't want to put fear. But the scripture says when we see God's kindness and his forbearance, God is giving us warnings of what's coming. He is giving us warnings. He is showing us. My goodness, even the secular news channels know what's going on. Even the secular economist knows what is ahead. You don't even have to be a prophet anymore. They understand. And God is giving time. He's giving time. Why? So that we could begin to enlarge our hearts. So that we could stand. So we don't have to be under a spirit of fear. So that we could come in the invitation. But we have to lay aside all the hindrances. We have to lay aside the sin. So this morning, can we take a few moments and say, Holy Spirit, search us. If there's something in my life that is grieving you, I want to confess it right now. And let me just say this in closing, and I'm taking a lot too much time. 
Some of you might be saying, well, I have a besetting sin that I've been dealing with for a long time and it's not going away. And you've been so discouraged about it that you've even stopped confessing it to God. Listen to me, don't stop. You don't make a treaty with whatever that is. You keep bringing it to God and God in his timing will break it, but don't make a treaty with it. Keep confessing it. Keep being honest about it. Keep yielding it to the Holy Spirit and the Lord is gonna give you the victory but you cannot make a treaty. You cannot make an excuse. So can we take a few moments and just ask, Holy Spirit, we invite you. I invite you in my life. I want an enlarged heart. I want to grow in an enlarged faith. I want to have enlarged prayers. I want my prayer life to enlarge. I want my, my peace to enlarge in you. I, I want vision of God to enlarge. So I'm asking you right now to search me and everyone in this room and to begin to bring up anything, anything that you need to put your finger on that needs to be confessed in this moment as we come to the table of the Lord, as we examine ourselves. Holy Spirit. Any wrong attitudes towards our spouses Lord, maybe even bitterness in our hearts because we feel like you have not answered a prayer, which is a sign that the thing that we were praying for means more to us than you. It means that we have put that as higher value than you. And God, we repent of that. God, we just ask that you would search and you would begin to enlarge hearts in this house. Enlarge our hearts. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often you do drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness this morning. God, we proclaim your death. We proclaim that first John says that we've confessed our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins because of your death. You don't just do it out of love, it says you do it out of faithfulness and justice. Meaning that Jesus did it in a just manner. He took every penalty. He took it, he paid the debt. And God, because of that, we could be completely forgiven and washed clean. So Holy Spirit, we receive that cleansing this morning. We receive it and we invite you now. We invite you now to do your work in us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now Springs Church, before I close, can you bear with me one more minute? Cause there's an important thing that I wanna pray over this morning. The Bible says that when we partake of that communion, we need to judge and make sure that we're examining the body. The scripture says the whole body meaning that the people in Corinthians, they weren't thinking about their brothers and sisters in the Lord. They were just worried about themselves. And the Bible says they drank judgment upon themselves. Today, listen to me, can we pray and can we lift up those that will one day be in the body? Yesterday, last night, we found out that Iran sent out over a hundred drones to strike Israel and ballistic missiles. Every one of them was shot down and we thank God for that. But do you know what the book of Romans says? The book of Romans says, be careful about how we treat the Jews in the church. Wanna know why? Because the Bible says, although they are hardened right now, 
It is for your sake so that the gospel might come to the Gentiles. But according to election, that's what the Bible says, God still loves them. And there's a day that he's gonna open up their eyes. There's a day that he's gonna come and he's gonna show them who their true Messiah actually is. And they are part of this flock. They're supposed to be part of this flock. We're all supposed to be part of the same olive tree. Those that have been grafted in as wild, even though some of the branches has fallen out, but one day would be re-brought back in. So today, can we just lift up Israel together? Can we think about those that will one day be in the body of Christ at our communion table? Could you stand with me? I know this is a long exhortation, but will you just stand and will you agree with me by faith? Father, we lift up Israel right now to you, Lord God. And we thank you for your protection over that nation. We thank you, God, that every one of those drones was shot down and every one of those missiles didn't make it to their targets. But God, we know, we know that this is not over yet. We know, God, that there is some uncertainty in the days ahead. And first and foremost, I wanna pray for the leadership of the nation of Israel, and I wanna pray for the leadership of our own country. God, I am asking in your mercy, you would raise up Daniels in the leadership. I ask that you would bring Messianic Jews that would be there that know how to get a hold of the wisdom of God on their knees. And they would speak counsel with wisdom, Lord God, to the leaders of Israel. They would speak it to our own leaders, Lord God. Raise up Daniels. Raise up Shadrachs, Neshachs, and Abednegoes. Raise up Esthers in this moment, Lord God that they would come and they'd have a voice from the Lord. They'd have wisdom from God and counsel in the days ahead. And God, we ask that in the midst of this anti-Semitism and what your people are feeling, that you would begin opening up their eyes to see that there's only one peace for Jerusalem. It can't be found through the military strength or just through the Iron Dome. It's gotta be found in Jesus and Jesus alone. And we pray that you would sweep across that land. We pray that you would sweep across America, across the Jewish populations. We pray that you would sweep across Europe and you would open up their eyes to see God, all their Passovers, all their ceremonies, everything that they do is all pointing to Jesus. God, bring in multitudes in the name of Jesus, we ask. We pray your protection over the nation now. And God, we even pray for the church in Iran. Oh God, bless that church. Lord, I pray that your people that are under that evil regime, God, that you would give them boldness and grace to continue to grow and to pray. God, I pray that you would keep meeting with outpourings of your spirit across Iran as well, that you would reap in many. Lord, think about this for a second. Iranians and Israelis, Iranians and Jews, Lord God, in the body of Christ together. God, we pray for that, Lord Jesus. Move across Iran. Save souls, Lord God. Move across Israel. Save souls and make that one new man for your glory, God. God, we commit this to you now and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen, amen, amen. I would have a song of worship, but we gotta get to the word today. We have such a strong and wonderful word. Do me a favor. Before we sit for a second, can I just take a moment, just greet everybody in the house and those that are watching online. But do we have any newcomers here? Any newcomers, first time visitors here at Springs Church? First time, anybody? I got a few people back here, look at this. A few over here. Ah, first time visitors, praise God. Would you do me a favor, would you turn around and greet some of these first time visitors and those in your seats? Would you greet each other in the name of the Lord? Just say it's great to be in the house of God. Turn wherever you're at and just give someone a big hug or a big high five or a big handshake and just say it's great to be in the house together. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Oh, what a joy to be in the house. What a joy to be in the house. Well, I just want to thank you, Spring Church. Your faithful giving here at the church has so blessed this house. We have sent 22 young adults out to a retreat this week. They're actually up in the mountains, up in Divide. They're getting away from all their technology and social media and everything, and they're just spending time in the presence of God. But it's through your faithful giving that many of them could go. They didn't have the money to go, and now they get to be there with the Lord. So I just wanna say thank you to all of you. If you'd like to give, you know how to do it in this house. You could do it online or through our app, or we have our donation buckets in the back. We have all our QR codes. You could use those behind the seat. But otherwise, I just want to say from my own heart as lead pastor, you've been so generous and have blessed us so much. So praise God for that. Lastly, I just want to say I am excited this morning because I am not preaching the word. 
Oh, I'm excited for that. I need a week just to rest, but you are in for a treat. Our incredible executive pastor, Pastor Billy's here and he's gonna lead us in the word this morning. Man, I don't get a lot of time to do this up at the mic. Can I, can I just, for a second, just totally take a moment just to just bless Bill, Pastor Billy. What a joy he is in this house. My God, he's been here for two years, our executive pastor. God has raised him up. And I say this all the time. I, I'm, I'm the passionate Italian. He is the cool cucumber. No, nothing phases Pastor Billy. I come in with like tons of issues. Say, look at all this stuff. Look at what we got to do. Look at what's going on. And he just sits there. He goes, mm-hmm. And just kind of walks into his room. And he spends a little time in prayer. Comes out. He is so, I'm punk rock. And he's like jazz. Like the two of us just hitting it together. But I am so grateful for him, man. He has been such a staple in this house. And he has a great word. So I want you to prepare your hearts for that. Praise God. All right. Turn your attentions with me to the video screens. A few announcements. And then we'll get into the word together. Good morning, Springs Church. We are so glad you joined us today. If you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. We invite you to scan the Connect QR code on the seat back in front of you. We just have a few questions that will help us to get to know you better. Now, before we hear a word from Pastor Billy, here are a few announcements. Join us as we behold the Lamb at our annual Passover Seder this Saturday at 6.30 p.m. This event will be hosted by Turn Ministry and will be a beautiful way to better understand the prophetic fulfillment of the Passover feast in Jesus. You will never look at communion the same way again. There's no cost to attend this event, but registration is required. If you're looking for a place to serve here at Springs Church, I wanna let you know that our coffee bar is looking to expand their team. They have a range of positions available from barista to cashier to cook. If you don't have experience, that's no problem. On-the-job training will be provided. If this sounds like the team for you, please visit the coffee bar after service to sign up. Our mission team to Kosovo returned last week and we wanna thank you so much for all the support that you gave us, both financially and through prayer. We spent the week connecting with the children of Kosovo through Lego building, worship songs, and impactful lessons. We want to invite you to hear more about the trip and all the Lord did through the team and through you. We will have a detailed Kosovo update this Wednesday during our midweek prayer meeting. We would love to see you there. If you are already giving to Springs Church, we want to thank you so much for your generosity. You make the work of this church possible. If you'd like to join us in our work here at Springs Church, we want to remind you of the three ways that you can give. You can give by placing your cash or check in the boxes located at the back of the sanctuary. You can give through our app, or you can scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you and give online. The easiest way to give online is to select the reoccurring giving option as you see here. Thank you for being such a generous church. And again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you need more information on today's announcements or any other ministries in our church, please check out our church app. You can find it by scanning the QR code on the seat back in front of you, or you can find it in the app store at springschurch-co.
Lord, we celebrate your faithfulness. We thank you that your promises never change. You pursue us in your love and in your mercy. You continue to draw our hearts back into communion with yours. All your promises are yes and amen. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that your presence is here even now, stirring up faith and reminding us that you have a plan for us. And we look forward to a day in eternity where we will rest with you forever. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Good morning, Springs Church. Pastor Michael, thanks for the shout out. I like to say that Pastor Michael and I are like Rocky Balboa and Apollo Creed in this ministry thing together. So it's a great partnership. As he said, it's been two years that uh, I've been on staff and it's been a blessing, great partnership with him and the elders and with the rest of our staff. And um, so always blessed to get a chance to share the word with you guys. Well, as you know, uh, we're in our uh, core four series. And so you guys know that we, we settled on language for our vision and our mission as a church. And we're teaching through the core four. It's kind of the, the four pillars that help us really understand how we're gonna execute to the vision. It's the four things that you guys should look for when you're trying to assess what the Lord is doing in the house. Um, so we'll just start just to reorient ourselves. Uh, we'll read the vision and the mission. I'm not gonna take a deep dive on all of the components and how we landed on the language. I'll encourage you guys to go watch our YouTube channel from last year. Uh, we had a, an elders kind of leadership round table where we talked through all of that. So that's good context for you. Um, but the vision, vision to Springs Church. Springs Church exists to ignite a passion for Christ and to equip believers for his mission in Colorado Springs and the world. So igniting a passion for Christ and equipping believers. That's the, the two core elements there. The mission statement. At Springs Church, we desire to be an authentic community of worshipers who are passionate about the four things, understanding scripture, practicing prayer, experiencing community, and developing calling. And we were talking in staff this week, and I was saying to all of them, I may just pop into your office and see if you've got this memorized yet. So I'll encourage you guys, you see staff in the lobby, give them a little quiz and see how much they've got down. Well, I'm gonna tackle understanding scripture this morning. And uh, we're going to teach through the four elements through the rest of this month. You can uh, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, and we'll just kind of leave a placeholder there while we talk about a few other things. I'm going to be in uh, Hebrews 4, 11 to 13 will be our verses this morning. The scripture says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I would say, first of all, that everything in the Christian life is enhanced by our understanding of scripture. The way we learn to pray, the way we learn to exist in community to together, the way we figure out our calling with the Lord, all of it has to stand on an understanding of scripture. It's easy sometimes to talk about calling when what we're chasing is, well, I, I'm chasing a title, I'm a pastor, I'm a missionary, I'm an evangelist, I have a healing gift. But without scripture, we never understand how to tether the spiritual gifts to the right spiritual character. And so everything has to stand on the power of scripture. In my journal, I wrote it this way. If you want to be spirit led, you have to be spirit fed. If you want to be able to understand how the Lord's leading you to go left, to go right in these last days, if you want to understand when he's telling you it's time to, to, to leap out in faith and to do something that he's asking you to do, if you're not steeped in the word of God, if this is not your spiritual diet, you're going to find yourself confused and running into ruin. So if you want to be spirit led, you need to be spirit fed. Now I'm the first one to admit the Bible is not always an easy read. It's dense, it gets technical. There are a lot of things that we have to search out through commentaries and visiting Pastor Michael's office and the elders. It's a difficult read sometimes. If I were to say to the staff, all right guys, we're gonna go through Leviticus for the rest of the year, they wouldn't be excited about that. 
Certain things in the scripture are hard to grasp, but the enemy wants you to believe that because certain things about it are difficult, that somehow you don't need to engage with it. He would love to draw you away from the word of God and get you caught up in just making decisions based on feelings and what the culture wants from us. And so we have to rail against that and say, well, if I'm gonna be led of the spirit, I need to be fed of the spirit. When I look back at my own life, in any seasons of life where I see the most growth, the most maturity, any places in life where I saw breakthrough, it always, always aligns with a time that I was consistently in God's word. When I, when I talk to young men that ask for mentorship and several things, if they wanna go any distance with me, we're gonna go through the Bible together. There's a lot of things you can do in mentorship, but I'm gonna shape the young men that God sends into my life through a time in the word, counseling through the word. Now, I know we started in Hebrews, and in my own study time and experience with the word, I think of Hebrews almost like its own commentary of the Bible. It, it reads as this long, almost like a summary of everything the Bible's been trying to say from Old Testament to New. Everything from the sacrificial system of the Jews to the priesthood to prophets, everything else, Hebrews details it and then shows us how it finds all of its fulfillment in Christ. Everything they were trying to do in the temple, everything the prophets were laboring to do in their ministry, everything the priests were trying to do in their sacrifices, we find it in its fullness, is fully explained and fully revealed in Christ. And Hebrews walks us through that. It was a letter that was written to Jewish Christians. These were people who, who came to faith, who had converted out of Judaism, and they were struggling in their new walk with the Lord. It's a great thing to say yes to Jesus, but it doesn't always mean great days. You sometimes are gonna say yes to Jesus and walk straight into suffering. And that's what they experienced. They were dealing with persecution. Imagine you can't get a job because you're marked. You're a Christian and no one wants to hire you as a Christian. You can't provide for your family. Imagine that you can't just go to the grocery store. You're getting jumped and beat up and mocked and ridiculed. And they came to a place where they said, maybe this isn't worth it. Maybe I'll go back to Judaism, things were a little more peaceful. I didn't have the same suffering. And so this letter is written to encourage them, no, don't turn back, don't slip into disobedience. The one who promised you, the one who saved you is faithful to bring you through. So wait on him. You guys know that I love to talk about sports and pretend that I actually had glory days, but I love to reflect on sports. And so in high school, uh, one of the years I decided to go out for wrestling and I quit almost as soon as I joined. And, and what happened was, the first strike was, I get in there and what I loved about wrestling was the exercise. I loved the, the challenge and, and I'm, I'm, I'm fighting with guys and I'm, I'm learning techniques. So those are the things I loved about it. What I did not love was what I figured out about the uniform with that spandex. <laughs> I didn't wanna deal with the spandex, but I said, you know what? That's part of the code, I gotta just do it. I'm gonna just suck it up, it'll be fine. Well, then I got hurt at a practice. And so I said, okay, between the spandex and then I got hurt, I'm not waiting for strike three, I'm done, no wrestling. So I quit the team. So sometimes we think about our, our faith walk in that way. We say yes to Jesus, it's a good thing. We take a step of faith and then man, we run into some resistance. We run into some hard times and maybe you'll take one lick or two, but you say, you know what? This has just put fire all over my life. I'm gonna go back to what I was doing. And that's where the Hebrews are. They're like, man, we, we've believed all of this preaching and we said yes, and all it has done is bring suffering into our lives. But the letter was written to encourage them to hold fast. As we look at our, our verse for today and, and the rest of, of Hebrews kind of as a whole, I'm gonna bounce through just a couple of themes, really three themes that I think are important for us. And then when it comes to really grasping scripture and understanding scripture, I, I believe you could really simplify it in three ways. The first is that the purpose of scripture is to show us the glory of God. It's to reveal the glory of God. That's what you see when you read through scripture, the revelation of Christ. The second theme that you'll find in scripture is that it exposes the wickedness of man. So you have this tension all throughout scripture, the glory of God, Christ revealed, and then the wickedness of man. We continually fight against God and, and resist God and rebel against God. And then in the third place, I call it the living love letter. It's God's open invitation to sinners. It's God meeting us with encouragement, reminding us of his promises to draw us back in to a place of rest with him. So the revelation of God, an expose on man and our wickedness, 
and then God meeting us by reaffirming his promises and drawing us back into him. The book of, of Hebrews opens and the writer doesn't even introduce themselves. They just go straight in to the most important thing, which is Jesus Christ is greater than all. So every chapter in the beginning of the book, all the way through, you find this argument that Jesus, they begin with, Jesus is greater than the angels. So when you think about angels, we know that angels are these magnificent created beings from God, brilliant and powerful and radiant. When they show up in scripture, people are constantly trying to worship them and they say, don't worship me, I'm just a witness, I'm a servant like you. They're powerful. There was a time when, when Israel was going to war with Assyria and they were terrified about what to do and the Lord sent one angel that killed 185,000 soldiers, one angel. They're powerful beings and yet, Scripture says Christ is greater. The angels are commanded to worship the Son of God. You go to the next chapter, it says Jesus is greater than Moses. We saw through Moses a great deliverance out of Egypt. He brought the, the Israelites out into the desert and he showed them signs and wonders and miracles from God. He brought us the law. The law and the commandments teach us the, the holiness of God, the character of God, and they show us that we can never attain to that. So we learn to cry out for a savior. All of what we gained through Moses was great, and yet the Bible says that Jesus is greater. Moses is described as a servant, Jesus is the son. The son always has greater honor than the servant in the house. Jesus is greater than Joshua. He brought the people into the promised land and it was just a symbol, it was a shadow of Jesus bringing us into eternal dwellings, into a promise with God in eternity. So it goes all the way through. Jesus is greater than the high priest. He's greater than Abraham. He's greater all the way through. And so we find that everything in the Old Testament, Hebrews shows us it has its fulfillment in Christ. Both in Hebrews and in Colossians, it says that all things were created through Christ and by Christ and for Christ, and that everything holds together in Christ. So everything the Bible's been trying to tell us is pointing us to him. So I love Hebrews for that reason because you may not have read the entire Bible, but if you read Hebrews, you really get a grip on what the Lord's trying to tell us through scripture. So we've talked about this idea of, of God in his revelation of, of himself. We, we see him in his glory. We get to see his character, his mercy, who he is. The second theme that runs right along with that is every place that you see the glory of God revealed, you find this devastating reality of the wickedness of man. The glory of God, him working miracles, speaking life, transforming, changing us. And then you find this resistance where man is constantly falling away. And so even in Hebrews, we read through those same chapters, Jesus is greater than the angels. And then right away in the next chapter, it says, hey, pay close attention to what you've heard, lest you drift away from it. Right where it says Jesus is greater than Moses, the next chapter says, okay, take care, lest there be in you an evil, unbelieving heart, and you slip away from what you've just heard. There's this constant sense of like the glory of God, and then, hey, be careful, because the wickedness in you is gonna cause you to turn away from that. The third theme is this living love letter, this encouragement and promise that God will work our, his, his good in us if we keep our confidence in him, calling sinners back to himself. So again, these themes keep showing. It's the glory of God, the wickedness of man, and then shortly thereafter, there's this promise where God says, okay, you've understood your wickedness. I've exposed it in you. Now let me reaffirm my promise. Let me bring you back to confidence in me. Let me show you how I'm gonna hold you if you will believe. We won't turn there, but let me just read to you some of the, the language of promise that you hear throughout the book of Hebrews. Uh, in one place it says that we can share in Christ if we hold fast our confidence. In another it says, he suffered for us and is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters before the Father in heaven. We're called to draw near to his throne and find grace and mercy in our time of need. He says, draw near with a pure heart, sprinkled clean of all evil, and let us hold fast to the confidence that we have without wavering, because he who promised is faithful. So as we grasp these three themes, the glory of God, the wickedness of man, and then God's promise to keep us, you get a good understanding of what scripture is about. 
Let's just walk through for a moment and kind of see how this comes alive in our passage for today. So Hebrews, again, 4, verse 11. And the passage starts by saying, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. And so you have to pause and think, well, what is it that we're trying to enter God's rest? What is it to rest with God? What does that look like to rest with God? I know when I rest, what that means is several selfish things, like nobody talk to me, give me the remote, I wanna watch Premier League soccer, get me a soda, I wanna be alone, I wanna rest in ways that benefit me. So what does it mean to rest with God? Am I on a lazy river coasting through heaven and angels are feeding me grapes and playing harps over me and I'm resting with God? What does it mean to rest with God? What you see through scripture about God's rest is that God always completes a supernatural work and then invites us into it with him. So he creates the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rests. And the Bible says he invites Adam and Eve into that rest with him. The, the rest and, and the work that God gives them is not striving to earn anything from God. They're not working for God to, to build up a 401k or to get a title or find validation. The, the rest is peaceful. The, the work when you're resting with God is basically saying, my only work is to celebrate his finished works for me. So we see the same thing at the cross, the, the creation narrative and, and a new work that Jesus does on the cross. He hangs there for six hours. He's been beaten and, and mocked and mutilated. And one of the last things he says before he dies is it is finished. The work of salvation is complete. Sin and death no longer have hold over my people for those that believe. So he dies and he's raised from the dead and then he invites us into a place of rest with him. So as Christians, we're supposed to orient all of our lives around celebrating his finished work for us. That's what it is to be at rest with him. So when he says, let us strive, to enter that rest, he's saying, let us focus our efforts and our attention and our energy on reflecting on his finished work for us. The reason he calls us to that is because he says in the next part of the verse, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So let us strive to enter that rest so we don't make the same mistake that our forerunners have made. All throughout scripture, what we've talked about, the glory of God, the wickedness of man. So we see this pattern of sin Everywhere that God pours himself out for us, we find man sinning and falling away. Now the word disobedience maybe doesn't seem like much of a, a word that, that's heavy, but it really, you should feel the sting of our offense towards God and this idea of disobedience. It's a little more than just like, I didn't take out the trash when you asked me or I didn't finish that report. This idea of disobedience, we're gonna summarize it in, in four ways. He's talking about a sort of disobedience that shows up as a constant pattern of sin. Um, we'll have some scripture references. I'm not gonna dig into them for the sake of time, but just listen to the idea of the sort of disobedience he's warning against. Number one, the word of God disrespected. Number two, the commands of God neglected. Number three, the holiness of God detested. And number four, the son of God rejected. So the disobedience that he's talking about, like I said, is not just a light thing of just like, well, no, thank you, God, I'm gonna try something else. It's actually a violent rebellion towards God. Scripture says when we get our mindset on our own stuff ahead of God's, we are hostile towards God. The nature of sin in us is a, it, it, you could call it like a murderous spirit towards God. You are at war with God. And so this type of disobedience he's warning against is the nature of sin. Uh, the idea that God's word is disrespected. He says, it's impossible to restore you to repentance once you've tasted of the goodness of the word and the powers of the age to come and to fall away from it. What he's saying is you've heard the preaching, we've heard it, we've read it, and when we consider that a small thing, when we disrespect it, when we don't honor it, we don't treat it as holy, there's no other way back into God's rest. And our sin will, will, will dupe us into thinking, well, I can find another way in. I'll go around. I don't have to go through the word. But the word has a process that it operates in our hearts. It cuts, it exposes the wickedness in us, and it draws us back into communion with the Lord. But he says, once you've heard the preaching and you're trying to dodge the operation of the word, it's a disrespect to the word. It's a disobedience that leads us away from him. The commands of God neglected. The idea is just that you go on sinning deliberately. He's called us to love, he's called us to good works. And when we have heard that preaching, when we know those things and we sin deliberately, he says this is that disobedience that leads you away. 
the holiness of God detested. It just means it's a strong dislike or a hatred for something. When God reveals his holiness to us, it can be offensive because it proves to us we're not our own God. We can't craft our own way. We can't order our own steps. The example that was given here was with Esau, if you guys remember the story. He, he has this incredible blessing from his father. He's the firstborn son, and he's out hunting or doing whatever in the fields with his brother, and because he's hungry, he sells his birthright for a bowl of soup. This inheritance was a sacred thing. It was a holy thing to God, and he detests it. He, he treats it scornfully. And so when we handle holy things from God in that way, it, it actually has a way of, of cursing and, and poisoning our souls. Imagine if the elders were gonna vote on a really important doctrine in the church, or you know, maybe other churches are saying, we're gonna get rid of the Old Testament and just keep the new, so all the elders need to vote. And Pastor Michael gives away his voting right because someone hands him a Diet Coke. And he's got a Diet Coke sitting next to him. I, we, can, we can joke about that because he would never do that, but that, that's how ridiculous, that's how vain that was it's a, to really detest the holiness of God. And then what happens is with Esau, with Cain, with several people, when God brings a conviction like that, they have the nerve to have a root of bitterness that springs up and the scripture's warning against it. Amen? You still tracking? And the last place it says the son of God rejected. So we have the, the word of God disrespected, the commands of God neglected, the holiness of God detested, and the son of God rejected. What they actually use throughout Hebrews for, for the language of rejecting the son of God, again, it's not just like a no thank you Jesus. They literally talk about trampling the son of God underfoot, profaning the blood, to imagine that he's poured his life out for us and, and that people would look at his suffering and mock him and spit at him and ridicule him. And so in the same sense, when we have this invitation from him, even in our day, to sit and, and say, I'm gonna reject that, it's no small thing to the Lord. So th this is actually trying to just paint a picture for us of what that wickedness is that's in our hearts. So that's our second theme. And our, our third theme, as we've talked about, is, is God's living love letter, the way that he meets us despite our wickedness to draw us back to him, to pull us back into communion and rest with him. So in verse 12, we pick up and it says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to, him, to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Okay, so why should it be an exciting thing to us that God's word is living and active? Why should that produce hope? Why should that matter to us? If his word is living and active, then what that means is his original promise is still good. What that means is that his invitation to us is still open. If the sinner would turn from evil and from wickedness, he will receive us back in. The word is living and active. The scripture says that all of the Bible is breathed out by God. These are not just random journal entries that we found from the forefathers of our faith. I mean, they are, but they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. So, so this is an authoritative word. It's breathed out by God. Scripture describes God's word as Jesus literally being the word in the flesh and dwelling among us. Scripture says that um, no prophecy of scripture was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this is a living word. And what other way might we say that the word of God is alive? Well, you could say that everywhere that God sends his word, he produces life. Everywhere that this word is preached, the Holy Spirit is rushing along behind it to produce life, to bring healing, to renew minds, to transform hearts, to restore marriages. So everywhere the word of God is preached, the Holy Spirit comes along and brings life. Some of you guys might know Zane and, and Jan Stoddard. Uh, they were missionaries for a long time in, in India and in Thailand. Uh, they've been members of this church for a long time and they're on our building committee, or our, um, excuse me, missions board now. Uh, years ago, they shared this, this testimony. It's one of my favorite stories about the power of God's word. The, the short version is that uh, they were ministering in some village, and as they're there, they've got their Bible out, and a man kind of breaks into the room, um, distraught, and he's a distraction, and they have to stop their teaching, 
and they're trying to work through a translator to understand what the guy wants. And so they're working through the translator and the, and the translator kind of looks at them and they're like, what's he saying? And he's like, I don't know. And they're like, well, well, what does he want? I don't know. Well, is he dangerous? I don't know. Well, let's go with him. So they all leave and they follow him through this dark wooded area. And then it starts to settle in as they're walking. This could actually be pretty dangerous for us. This could be an ambush. We might be being led away to, to, to be killed or, or whatever. And so um, as they're getting along, they get to this other village where he was taking them and they see kind faces and people are smiling. And so they usher them into this room and the room is packed. And they're kind of sitting on the floor, crisscross applesauce, knees are touching, everybody's jammed in. And they kind of rush Zane and Jan uh, towards the front of the room. And then they look and the guy that had brought them there was... He, he had signaled and they, they had a Bible and they, they start passing the Bible up over the heads of the people to the front of the room. So the translator and this guy finally start talking and making sense. And the guy says, tell us about the God of this book. Tell us who this is. And he says, someone left this book here with us years ago, but none of us can read. They just said to pray to the God of this book and that he would help our lives. But none of us in the village know how to read. So all we would do is we'd come here, we'd move the ribbon, we'd flip a page, and then we'd close it and we would just pray, God of this book, show us who you are. Everybody in that village, they said the men were alcoholics. They beat their wives, they wouldn't send their kids to school, they were abusive, they, weren't, they wouldn't go to work. They said when we started doing this page flip every day, our hearts started to change. We, we didn't have a taste for alcoholism anymore. We sent our kids to school, our marriages were restored. Tell us who this is. And this is people who can't read the word. How much more will the word take effect in our lives when we can read it and podcast it and community group it? Amen? So this is what the scripture is telling us, that it's living and it's active. It's not a dead text. It's not just something we found that maybe makes us feel good. God's word is living. It is active. Every time he speaks, every time he breathes, it accomplishes the purposes for which he sent it. So these Hebrews that are struggling in their faith and they're considering giving up, the writer is telling them, listen, go back to that original faith. Hold that confidence that you had from the beginning. And even in suffering, the Lord will produce life in you. He will remind you of his promises and his goodness in such a way that it'll hold you even in persecution. He will show you that he's worth it and he has a better reward. There's this illustration about the word of God being sharper than a two-edged sword. The, the idea there is that through the, the reading of the word, he, he helps us to actually cut and, and discern what's of God in us versus what has to be cut away or circumcised away from our thinking and our feelings. He says he, the, the sword cuts between soul and spirit. Your spirit is a place of communion with God. That's your conscience. The, the soul is the place of emotion and personality. And some of us fall away in our faith. We drift in our faith because we follow our emotions. We're caught in our feelings. And it's hard to tell. Is God telling me to do that? Is that me? And the way that you divide between soul and spirit is by the word of God. He clarifies his will for you. He clarifies his intent for you. It's not that feelings are bad, but they have to be under the authority of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says we're to take every thought captive. You're to bring your feelings under subjection with what the word of God says about you. In one moment, I can be having a great day and I love my calling and then I get a couple emails and some bad feedback and I'm like, I'm, I'm done, I don't wanna be a pastor. So it, my feelings are gonna take me every which way, but I find the Lord's call in my life by centering myself in the word. So he divides between soul and spirit. It says joints and marrow. This idea that the sword of the spirit can cut bone and expose the marrow. Some of us only see ourselves as the dead bones we used to be. We can't get out of the, the, the sinfulness that we used to commit and we have a hard time seeing ourselves as anything other than what we used to be and the word of God comes through his promises and through his loving truth and he says, I will actually cut the bone and I will expose that there's marrow in there. There's life, a life force that I've put in there. It's like he's saying, I'm gonna cut through the old self and show you that I'm doing a work in you. It comes about through the reading of the word. You're not defined by your sin. You're not who you used to be. And by the power of the word, I'm gonna to expose to you. I'm gonna cut and it's gonna hurt. And you're gonna doubt me sometimes and you're gonna resist me sometimes. But if you'll stay with me, I will show you that I'm doing a work inside of you. I've started something in you by my Holy Spirit. I can cut through bone. You are not dry bones. There's life in there if you believe in me. Amen. 
The sword cuts both ways. It's a place of cutting and revealing and, and, and circumcising the heart and showing us God's will, but it also pierces us. Sometimes you're gonna say, well, Lord, I said yes to you. I came, I did what you asked me to do. And all I find is that you're just cutting, cutting, cutting. Get rid of that friendship. Get rid of that hobby. Get rid of that entertainment thing. You're asking me to give money and serve. And it just feels like I've come to you and it's just cut, 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 cut. And there's no wholeness in it. But what you find is it's almost like we find security in all these things. You're in this little cocoon and the Lord is trying to say, I've got a whole world out there for you. The little cut, one at a time, cut, cut. And he's got something that actually blooms that's far better. It's a life he's put in us. And he's got so much more planned for us than we could imagine. And he reveals it through the cutting, through the preaching of his word. So we cling to scripture to, to have Christ revealed to us, to let his light shine on us. We yield to the cutting of the sword to see the wickedness that's in us, not, not for the sake of shame or beating ourselves up, but so that God might actually deliver us from it. And then what we find that's so sweet about his presence is that even in the wickedness, he meets us and says, okay, here's the promise. Hold fast to what you've known of me because you've never gone too far. If you'll turn, if you will release yourself and get away from the wickedness, if you will come back to me, I have a promise and we will come into rest again together. Well, let's stand together. I wanna to offer just three quick things as we close. First of all, if you're here and you don't have the assurance that your life is secure with the Lord, you've never made that decision to confess your sins to the Lord and accept Jesus' salvation and his work on the cross for you, if you have never done that and you don't have that confidence that it should the Lord call us home today, you would be with him in eternity, we wanna give you an opportunity to do that. So if you wanna say today, I'm placing my hope and my trust and my faith in Jesus. Just raise a hand and we wanna pray with you. And I know that it can be awkward. The old pastors used to say it's good to take a stand here with a bunch of people that love you because being a Christian, you're gonna have to take a stand by yourself several other times in this life. So do it with people that love you and we've all done it before too. If that's your heart today and you need to make a commitment before God, we wanna pray with you. The second thing is, if you're in here and you would say, man, you know, I, I'm a believer. I, I would say my hope is in the Lord, but I have not held this word up to be holy. I have not committed myself to letting this word search me. I've trifled with holy things. I've toyed with sin. It's not about shame. I want you to come forward too, and we're gonna pray together because I believe the Lord wants to meet us. He wants to set a fear of the Lord in our hearts. He wants to open up this word to us to, to cut away the wickedness, to cut darkness out of us and to redeem us and bring us into to rest with him. We're gonna take a moment to worship together. And if you're in any of those camps, I want you to come forward. We're gonna pray. The pastors are here. The prayer team will come up. And we just wanna take some time to really do business with God. The final thing I'll mention is that um, we would love to, to bless you with a gift of having a Bible. If you're newer to the faith, newer to the church and you don't have a Bible, uh, right outside these doors to my left, there's a Connect Center. Some of our pastors and ministry leaders are there. We would love you to walk out with a Bible in your hand today and to start this journey of letting the Lord speak to you and show you himself and show you his, his good plans for you as well. Amen. Let's take a minute to search our hearts. We'll worship and the altar is open for you. Praise again, oh my. 
Lord, we praise you for the gift of having your word. We know that you went to great lengths to save us. And you follow that up by giving us this love letter of your promises to draw our hearts back to yours. We regard your scripture as holy. We regard you as holy. Set a fear of the Lord in our hearts, God, that we would not trifle with holy things. Let us see how your word is living and active in our lives, God. Produce life as you see fit. Cut away from within us the things that are wicked, maybe even things that we love, but circumcise our hearts and our thinking, our speech. Let us orient our lives around your finished work for us. Let us be living epistles, as the word says. Let us walk with your word written all over us. Let it be obvious that we are from your kingdom for your own glory and for your own namesake. God, we thank you for the promise of your presence with us. Holy Spirit, as the preaching of the word has gone forth, would you follow it up? Would you bring life? Would you produce life? Would you work miracles and breakthrough in the lives of your people? We bless you and we thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we give the Lord praise this morning, his goodness to us. Praise God. Well, again, um, please make your way to the community center, the Connect Center here to grab a Bible. Our prayer team is here. We're just going to linger in the Lord's presence. And if we can pray with you, if we can encourage you or answer questions, we'd love to do that. Other than that, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. To our online friends and family, God bless you. We thank you for worshiping with us. We look forward to seeing all of you on Wednesday night at 630 uh, or on next Sunday. Praise God for you. God bless you.